a lot of fun. Okay, guys, so here we go. Here's the director, Chris Cublin, and then we have actor Michael Rispoli. Give him a hand. Awesome to have you guys here. That trailer is, is a great trailer because I think it really shows what the, sh what the movie's about and also gives a little taste of the, of the humor and the, and the fun that you guys have with the characters. Um, so tell me, how did you guys first meet? How did you guys first get to collaborating on this film? Uh, well, the script was sent to me by Michael Mailer, our producer. Um, I met with he and the uh, original writer, Greg Greenberg. Uh, I love the material. I, I completely immediately responded to the Shakespeare mafia parallel. Uh, and then kind of the first person I thought of for the role was Michael Rispoli and I, I met with my casting director we both agreed he was the best we sent him the script he uh, agreed to meet with me and uh, through a very nerve-wracking lunch I convinced <laughs> him that I would be flexible enough to you know turn it into what it needed to be uh, and you know we got along we, we just had the same movie references and thoughts about film and we, and we were both turned on by the elements that involved you know, the behind the scenes of making movies and theater and the history of film. And it just went from there. And once Michael signed on, we worked on the script for rather a few months. And then uh, Michael's involvement brought us other actors and we got to make the movie. That's great. I hope it was a nice uh, Italian restaurant. What did you guys, where'd you guys meet? Do you remember? No, well, he chose it. It was in, uh, it was in uh, Rockefeller Center, but it wasn't Italian. So. <laughs> no, but we, we did sit outside. We didn't walk out right after then, so it must have been a good lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it was great. And then also, <laughs> once, we started, once we started working on hey, everybody. Once we started working on it, we go, went to Greg's house, Greg Greenberg, who was uh, the original writer. And we, we sat down, and we'd be there till 2, 3 in the morning. We'd order Chinese. So nice. We ate there we Chinese, go. too. Oddly, there was very little Italian food involved <laughs> at all. Just in the script. Yeah. So Michael, I mean, how did you find this character? Did it connect with you in, in your own path? I mean, what sort of similarities were you able to pull from your own career and your own experiences? Yes, uh, Charles. No, that's great, because when I, uh, and when I first read the script, what I loved about it were the different elements in there, the, the theater. Uh, you know, I come from the theater, had a theater company for many years, and then uh, the film world, obviously, in the mob movies. I play a lot of cops and crooks. I've been in a lot of mob films and, and uh, shows and things like that. So um, in talking with Greg Greenberg, we were, I said, I know this world, you know. I mean, I know this world. I know the theater, the backstage, the onstage development, you know, of shows, all of that, and... Uh, and I know all of the extras that are that whole extras world because every time you do a mob movie in New York, in particular, you run into pretty much the same guys. You really? Know? Yeah. So they're all they're all there, and you get to know them by name, and they you now they tell you what they've been doing lately, and <laughs> they had a little bit, they had a walk on here and a walk off there, that kind of stuff. So so it was great. That's what drew me to the script and That's the project. Awesome. Yeah, and you were able to bring some of the people that you knew, some of the actors that you knew in, into the cast, as Chris was saying. And Chris, how did it feel for you to work with, I mean, you're a relatively you know, young filmmaker. What did it feel to be working with these kind of guys who are experienced? They've been on sets with you know, some of the greatest filmmakers ever. You know, Was that, was that intimidating? Mean, yeah, when you work with someone like Michael Rispoli, he raises your game, mm -hmm. and Michael even more so. Uh, there were... Uh, yeah, there were days when it could be a little overwhelming having six, seven guys, and I'm staging Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, um, you know, I, uh, casting is like the most important part of directing. And I think uh, the faith that I put in these guys by casting them in the film, they reciprocated by having faith in me. And so I, I didn't really have any problems with any of the actors. It was much more of a collaborative environment. I tried to create a familial atmosphere on set. And if something wasn't working, we could like dig into it together and fix it. And, uh, you know, Michael had my back if that wasn't the case. So it worked out. That's great. Um, well, Michael was talking a little bit about uh, the behind the scenes of, a, of an extra life in those kind of films. And so we have a couple clips for you guys, and we're going to show you the first one right now that kind of showcases what you were talking about. Okay. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So we have, you know, Paul Ben Victor, who's fantastic. Oh, in this, Paul's the, great. Uh, man. He's terrific. He plays my best friend, Denny, yeah, and he's tremendous in everything he does, and in here in particular. <laughs> what, what particularly was like, do you guys have an inside joke on set, or what was it like working with him? Did, what was he like when you first um, asked him to do the role or be in the film? I begged Paul on Skype <laughs> in L.A. to come and do the role. Uh, and thankfully he agreed because he's just wonderful. Uh, the first day that these guys worked together was really the first day they met. 
I really? think they, there was a minor photo shoot early on where we photoshopped them into some you know, stills from uh, classic mob films, but uh, there's a scene in a limousine where they're driving together and they're meant to be portrayed as best friends, and I was crouching out in the back of my little monitor <laughs> with these two like giant Hollywood character actors who've worked mm. on dozens and dozens of movies and shows, and you know, little old me, uh, and they like eased into it as if they had known each other for their entire lives, and it, it was remarkable to watch um, you know, just two pros at work, just doing it, and uh, I was blessed to have the two of them together. It worked out well. Yeah. What was it like for you, Michael, to you know get in a room with Paul and get to work with him? No, and, uh, well, it was great because again, I mean, Paul and I hadn't worked together before, so uh, but I've known him. You know, I've known. Of right. Him. You know what it is? We all know each other. All the character actors know each other. Certainly, the urban New York character actors know each other, and again, we know the extras and and stuff as well. So. Um, and we all admire each other's work because it's tough. You know, it's hard. You, you go out there and you, and um, there's only a few roles that are to be had. And you know, I said I didn't get that role. Who got it? They tell me I said good for him. You know, mm, that's good yeah. because another one will come around. Right. So it's there's a real generosity of spirit. You know, when it comes to that kind of thing. So when working with Paul, we just kind of just started riffing. We started mm. riffing and riffing because this was the environment that. Chris put together on the set that we could improvise and find the rhythms of what we needed. So it was the same when we were in the limos together talking and, you know, we're supposed to be best friends for 40 years. And, and, um, and it, it was great because we were able to mix it up because I trust in him and he trusted in me, I guess, and we trusted in Chris and we trusted in the script. And that's the biggest thing when you're doing a film like this is that everybody steps on the set and trusts each other. So. Right. Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about maybe your favorite scene that came out of that sort of improvisation or uh, those guys working together? If there well, was I'll, something I'll, else. I'll address one of the clips that you showed me that you're going to show. Um, it's a scene that is uh, during rehearsals. Mm. And originally in the script, it was like two scenes. And from the standpoint of, of story days and keeping the film tight, we've needed to find a way to consolidate what would have felt like a couple of weeks of rehearsal into one scene. So with Michael's help and my cinematographer, Austin Schmidt, who was fantastic, we, we built this scene where it's just one tracking shot across the stage. And I kind of, I, I knew what characters I needed to come and address Nick as the producer, like this is what we need here. Mm. But I had them go off and mostly improvise their own stuff. And they came back to me with, with such wonderful stuff that we were able to build it from there. And you'll see the scene in a minute. And so much so that there were jokes that worked in that scene that I then wrote bringbacks into the later parts of the script to shoot later. Uh, and it was just a, a, a total team effort building this. And it's my favorite shot in the film. And it conveys you know, the, the hassles that a producer or a director might have in putting up a play all in one shot that's meant to take place in one day. But it feels like it could be two weeks of rehearsals. I think it succeeds. And um, it was with everybody's help. It just, uh, it just worked. That's awesome. And Michael, I mean, I think people see actors like you get on the on the screen and in films, and they wonder where did this guy come from? Like, how did yeah. he get into movies? You know, because you're not the typical like you know actor. You know, you, yeah. you have you bring this character bit to it, and you have this great charisma. And so, how did you, you first get into show business? I mean, how did you start? Well, third grade, I played Santa Claus in the Christmas play. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Young start. And I have to tell you. Everybody clapped for me at the end, so I really thought they were clapping for me. They were probably clapping for Santa Claus because I got to throw out the candy from the, from the sack <laughs> at the end of it all. But uh, I don't know. I was just kind of stuck from then. I, I just uh, loved doing the plays at school and, um, and loved watching all the movies on TV. And, and, uh, and I used to watch uh, Gene Kelly and all the musicals. And I said, this guy's tough and he can dance. Look how he can move. I mean... I loved it. So I thought I was a singer for a long time until I went out for the musical and they said, you can't sing, so <laughs> we're going to put you over here. Um, but anyways, I just, I went to college and I studied and I got my theater, uh, you know, my fine arts and theater uh, degree. I finished early. I came down to the city. I went to Circle in the Square, which is a two-year program, a terrific program. And, um, and then I started doing uh, theater off-off-Broadway, off-Broadway. Uh, theater basements everywhere, you know, and then we started our own theater company, and then I started doing film and TV, so. So I've always wanted to do it, and I'm lucky enough to have pursued it, 
and, and I'm able to do it, so that's great. It's crazy, because your, your character, Nick, he has almost the opposite path. Like, mm -hmm. he finds theater last, you know, and that's how he builds his, his uh, abilities, you know? Yeah. And uh, your character actually gets to start in some commercials, and we're going to show a clip of one of the commercials that, where he has it, and then he's yeah. going to move on. So we're going right, to show one, one more clip right now. That's a lot of fun, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, so yeah. did you ever get to do Shakespeare when you are growing up doing theater? So were you familiar with the play that you guys put together in uh, this, uh, Julius Caesar? You know? Yes, I, yes. I, in my theater company, we did a lot of Shakespeare. We did As You Like It, we did Macbeth, the Scottish play for, but, you know, I guess this is a theater, but it's okay. <laughs> um, we did uh, Twelfth Night, we did, I mean, we did a lot of Shakespeare, actually. And when I was studying school, we, at school, we did Shakespeare. But as I went into the... Uh, the business part of it, the working part of this business, I was not asked to do Shakespeare. So I, you know, I went with, you know, you need to be, in order to start working, you have to be stereotyped. And, and so they, they say, okay, that's who that guy is. Let's get him for this. That's how you start working. That's how you start getting paid and, and you develop a career as, a, as an actor. But after a while, it can certainly pigeonhole you and then it's tough to break out of that. But if you want to start working, uh, you kind of have to go along with that. And that's what's great about the script. Another element that uh, Greg Greenberg, you know, put in uh, originally, and, and which we honored all the way through, um, was that these guys are just stereotyped, pigeonholed into these roles. And to try and get out of that, it's really difficult. You got to kind of go in the complete opposite direction. So when it came to we're going to do a play, but not just any play. We're going to do Julius Caesar. Right. We're going to show him Shakespeare, and we don't know how to do Shakespeare, and it's a comedy of errors, and, you know, but to us, it's the original Godfather, and Brando did it, so it must be good. Yeah. You know? So that's why that was chosen. And I think that idea came from Greg's sons, Lewis and Alexander, because they're the brains behind the whole outfit. Oh, wow, that's really funny. Yeah. And, and how were you feeling, uh, Chris, about taking on uh, Shakespeare yourself? You well, know? I mean, you know, as a, as a writer and as, as a filmmaker um, and as a reader, I'm f familiar with, you know, quite a bit of Shakespeare, but, of course, uh, also, uh, you know, occasionally overwhelmed or daunted by it. And that's what I liked about the script. It made it accessible. Uh, it was a very intelligent idea. Greg Greenberg, our writer, is over here. Uh, original writer. You can give that a hand. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's amazing. This is a brilliant idea. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I used to say to people who are not in the business or or aren't familiar with Shakespeare, when they asked me, you know, how do you understand it, I would say, you know, pretty much what you whatever you think it means is what it means. And I thought that there was something really nice about the idea of guys who maybe wouldn't normally be well versed in Shakespeare putting forth their effort and their experience to, to convey to an average audience in, say, Staten Island, Shakespeare in a way that they'll, you know, ideally understand it. And, you know, what's nice about the film is, without giving it away, um, you know, we, we, we show that anybody can enjoy and experience and learn from Shakespeare, mm. which I think is true. Yeah, absolutely. And Michael, what was it like to sort of uh, get to work with your old friends from various shows, you know, like Paul and all those guys? Well, and... you know what? It, it was great because um, to call the, everybody, you know, to give them a call and say, hey, there's a, we have this great little script and we're going to do it and it's a quick movie and mm -hmm. you're going to come in, you're going to have a blast. And we had a great time on the yeah. set every day, whether the truck showed up or not, because, <laughs> you know, sometimes it didn't, but we just made do, and that was part of the fun, you mm -hmm. know. And, um, and like, uh, uh, Tony Sirico, who played Paulie Walnuts. He's fantastic, he's, Tony He's Sirico. phenomenal. Yeah, he's... And then Anthony DeSando, also, who was on The Sopranos, who plays Bananas, and he's terrific. Annabella Ciora, the great Annabella Ciora, yeah, yeah. was tremendous. And Brilliant. she easily, every one of them, um, Louis Venaria, Joe D'Onofrio, as you see, Armin mm. Garrow, all these guys, every one of them did not want to play the stereotype of they wanted to, in a sense, you know, raise up and say, we're Italian-American, we're all honest, hardworking people, we enjoy fun, we like to laugh, we're all about family and stuff. And what's great about that was that they all got on board for that, mm. you know. So the little bit we have a, is the feds. Once we start doing the once we start doing the play and we're rehearsing for the play, the feds, because we all look familiar from little bits and pieces of mob movies, right. um, they start surveilling the theater. They think <laughs> something's up because, you know, because they're looking for a real life mob guy who's on the lam. 
and uh, they think what's happening at the theater here, and they're not sure. It's a front. It's a front. Yeah, you, yeah, know, yeah. you know, it's a front for a mob meeting, you know, type of thing. And um, and we, you know, uh, we love that element because we're not. We're just, you know, again, <laughs> honest, hardworking Italian Americans. So. Absolutely. And was there anybody, you know, that you that you have yet to work with that you'd love to work with? I mean, who else have you had out there? Michael, you've had a long career, and. I mean, uh, you know, I've worked with uh, I've worked with quite a number of yeah. people. I mean, I'm I'm happy. I'm very happy and content with who, who I've worked with, and I hope to work with uh, more and different people. And I also like to work with the same people again. I've had, except for a couple of uh, experiences with everything I've done, um, all of them have been great for their own reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and the people who aren't around anymore, I guess, are the ones that I would miss the most. So. Right. Michael's one of the, the rare, like, successful Hollywood actors that will go from doing The Rum Diary with Johnny Depp, right. where they're in, like, almost every scene together, to working with an unknown director uh, or a little-known director like myself. And I know he just did a film with, a, with an up-and-coming director uh, that he was excited about. So, you know, you don't get a lot of that. Mostly, when they're at, once they've penetrated Hollywood, right. they're not going back. Absolutely. And in Michael's well, case, he wants to work with interesting and new people, fresh material. Uh, and, you know, it was a blessing for us, yeah. that's for sure. And well, we have a lot of filmmakers that actually listen to the podcast of this. You know, what you know, advice could you give Chris, you know, for, for a young filmmaker who wants to get started? Is there one thing that you picked up on this set maybe that you'll never forget? Or uh, uh, Well, you know, I think uh, intellectually, I think I knew that filmmaking is almost entirely about the actors. And, and now I am in the habit of telling people it is entirely about what goes on between the humans in front of the camera. <laughs> And I, I definitely learned that on this project. Uh, it's just, um, you know, it's great, beautiful cinematography, shot design, editing, costume. But if there's nothing worth watching in front of that, it's meaningless. Mm. Whereas if you have two good actors doing something interesting, you know, uh, with each other on screen, you could shoot it with a GoPro from the floor. Mm. And it can be amazing. So the other thing I would say is write a script. Mm. Because there's a dearth of good scripts in Hollywood and everywhere. And if you can write something good, you have a, a better chance of getting it made mm. rather than, you know, trying to uh, get in by the way of, you know, shooting something flashy. Yeah. It's about the story and it's about the actors. So screenplay and acting. And I think that uh, filmmakers would be smart to pursue it in that direction, in that way. Yeah, well, that first tip that you were talking about, the, the tracking shot and everything like that and taking advantage of the moment that's happening, we have a clip of that. that so we're going to show Great. that right now and then we'll keep on talking. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. No, it's yeah. great. Yeah. It's great. It seems, it's, how many times do you have to do that, Michael? Did you, were you in the zone when you were doing that? How many, how many takes was that? Or, you know, uh, you know how many coordinate it, all it that? Was a, there was a few takes. It was, just six. Setting the, it was setting the shot up. Oh, there you go. Six. Yeah. Six. So it was setting the shot up, and we were improvising each time. We just needed to make certain elements, make sure certain elements hit home, you know. You know, there were yeah. jokes that were there. Greg's joke about the Greeks and the Romans, that was always in the script. Right. So it just became everybody finding a thing that defined their character. And then Michael came up with one of my favorite improvs in the film when she asked for her, him to write a love scene for her and Casca, <laughs> who she's having an affair with in real life. And he says, I'll call up Shakespeare, sure. <laughs> yeah, that was um, great. So yeah, I mean, it just uh, it, it came together in a way that was that was pretty great. Mm. And Chris, did you have any films that you were studying? I know a lot. Of, you know, you know, directors will have a palette, or they'll have an inspiration reel, sure. or something like that. That they'll. Yeah, watch. I mean, uh, me and my uh, cinematographer Austin Schmidt, we talked mm. about Bullets Over Broadway. Mm. We talked about Casino. Mm. Uh, so you see a lot of uh, blown out white hot spots, lights. Um, and that uh, dark moodiness. The color palette is the same palette I kind of use in most of my films, or mm. apparently all three of them, which is uh, that uh, the, it's, uh, you know, there's not really too many primary colors. I mm. like warm lighting. I grew up in a home where, you know, there are lamps everywhere and yellow bulbs and rather than fluorescent lighting or anything like that. Right. Uh, so I went in that direction. And then from the standpoint of films themselves, I mean, uh, Michael talked about, um, uh, to Be or Not To Be, Lubitsch's To Be or Not To Be, which is a great film about theater and uh, uh, sort of uh, comedies of errors and misunderstanding and so on and so forth. Um, I'm a huge fan of Sullivan's Travels, right. Press and Surges, which is about a comedy director that decides he wants to make serious films and becomes a hobo out on the road only to learn that he should just continue doing what he's great at, which is making people laugh. Yeah. Um, he learns that in prison, watching one of his films with other prisoners, and he sees how it's cheering him up. And those kind of films where they just give you like a little chill with the thematic element of it, and 
you know, I'm a sucker for a happy ending as well. And then that also explore, uh, give you a little bit of that inside joke thing with Hollywood. I always enjoy those, whether yeah. it's The Player or Shakespeare in Love um, or Sweet Smell of Success. They're all great movies about film and, and theater uh, that I think people have a, a certain response to if they're made well enough, uh, where it makes them feel a little bit like they're on the inside. And I like yeah. that. Yeah. You know, Charles, there's, there's another thing, um, and I know you're talking about style of film and, mm. and, and, and the script and everything, but uh, the other element that's infused throughout here is uh, Guys and Dolls or the Runyon, a Runyon-esque element to yeah. the story. Because, and the reason that works so well is because uh, Greg loves uh, Luck Be a Lady, the song Luck Be a Lady, and Guys and Dolls, as do I. And, as do um, I. <laughs> and I love Runyon, and I've read a lot of Runyon, and, and as have Greg and, and uh, Chris. But um, the whole, you know, the, the Runyon characters are a little larger than life, you know, and everything, and, they, and there's always a bunch of guys hanging around trying some little scheme or something. So um, that, the, that lightness of heart was important for the, the script and all the guys together and the certain types of... Um, Oh, the, I guess a little bit different style. You saw in this uh, tracking shot, there's a, a woman there, the actress is Mandy Bruno, and she says, cappuccino. <laughs> da, 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 <laughs> yeah, with two sugars, yeah. Throughout and the that's movie. A, and that was a little bit of an ode to, you know, Adelaide or, uh, you know, from Guys and Dolls. Absolutely. Or, you You're know. asking film influences, um, Jennifer Tilly's character in Broadway, Danny Rose. Right, that right. kind and, of thing. I'm sorry, Bullets Over Broadway yes. or Mia, Mia Farrow in yeah. Broadway, Danny Rose. So it's, that kind of thing was adding to the whole, again, the fabric of the piece. Yeah, absolutely. And Michael, I have to ask you, you know, sure. this, this character takes on something completely different in his career, you know, and that's what, what gets him through, you know. For you, what was there a time in your career when you had to do something completely different that was a little unnerved, but, you know, by? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I guess, yeah, geez, it's been a long time. Um, there's always little watermarks in your career that, you know, you say, wow, you know, I just broke through something personally as an actor, as a creative being type of thing. Um, I had been doing, you know, stage for a long time and I did film. I did a film called While You Were Sleeping Mm -hmm. With Sandra Bullock and yeah. I played it. <laughs> it's a great I, movie. Yeah. I, yeah, no, it's a great movie. Joe it was Jr. a lot of fun. And I have to tell you, we had the best time on that set. Mm. We laughed off camera. We just laughed when the camera wasn't rolling, when it was rolling. We had a it was great. It was it was great. John Turtletown was the director and obviously Sandra mm. was there, Peter Boyle, all these great actors. And um and I played this kind of goofball, you know, Italian mm -hmm. guy, which I was just a character that I kind of came up with at the time, and it kind of hit home. A lot of people really liked it. Yeah. And that all of a sudden kind of like, kind of catapulted, it, it opened other doors right. for me doing that. They wanted me to be that guy as the gas station attendant. They wanted me to be that guy <laughs> all over the place. And I had to resist that a little bit because I didn't want to get stuck there, you know? Right. Um, but that opened up a lot of doors, which was great because then I was able to move on to some other, some other roles within that. So. Um, within that realm. Um, so I don't know if that's exactly answering your question, but I try to you know, push myself uh, with things. You know, I just did a play oh, nice. with Stephen Adley Geerges called Between Riverside and Crazy. And my character's not a likable character, and I usually play likable characters. Yeah. And it was great. It won the Pulitzer Prize for drama this year. It was a very, we were all worked so hard on that. It was a real ensemble. Austin Pendleton directed it. We just did it in January, February, March. Um, so usually I would play likable goofball characters, right. and I've had to play the heavies, and I've also had to play guys who aren't nice at all. Yeah. So that seems to be that, that kind of range. Yeah. I would imagine it's weird when people recognize you, because it's from something completely different every single time, or yeah. maybe it's from one thing. What's like the craziest occurrence of that maybe you, you can recall? Well, it's always when they get you when you're in the bathroom. You know, <laughs> it's, you know, you're at a restaurant, and... You get up to use the men's room and you're standing, you know, in front of the urinal. The guy comes up and goes, hey, man, I saw you in Rounders. Man, you were great. Can you come to my table afterwards? I go, can I wash my hands first? Time? You know, that kind of thing. But it's always when they want to approach you, it, it's on their time. It's never on your time. That's why, unfortunately, some people might get a bad reaction from actors, mm. you know, because uh, if they just come up to them just out of the blue because they're so excited, but right. maybe that person's not having the best day or they're on their way somewhere, or you know, whatever. 
Absolutely. And so, but yeah, it's the bathroom when they try, they <laughs> figure they can trap you there at least. There you go, no bathrooming occurrences here, guys. Um, how about you, Chris? What's, um, what's next for you? You know, you just completed a play. I mean, is there another movie that you're working that's on right now? you're gonna ask or? me about the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm working on a, a project that's set in uh, the North Shore of Long Island in the 80s, sort mm -hmm. of. Um, uh, back to Long Island or? Back to Long area, Island, yeah. yeah we'll like probably it. shoot it out there. It's uh, got a bit of an expensive soundtrack. Our music supervisor, David Leinart, is here on this last movie. Did a great job. Hopefully he'll be able to get me to get Van Halen to let me use much of their music. That would be awesome. Uh, but yeah, it's just uh, the trials and tribulations of a family going through the 80s and all the things that we know sort of turned topsy-turvy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Later Days. Uh, working on a few other book adaptations and uh, hoping to direct something real soon. Yeah, what kind of style are you like going to go for with this? I mean, are you going to continue with the same sort you of You know, style I or? swore I would never make another comedy because it's just so hard. <laughs> My first film was a comedy and you have to think of all the things that you always think of in making any film. Shot design, am I developing the story, am I forwarding character, you know, mm. how am I going to edit this? And then, by the way, is this funny? Mm. Um, and is the funny interrupting with the story point that you're trying to get across. So I swore I wouldn't do that again. So it's, it's more in the drama vein. Uh, you know, I, I hate doing the, the meets this, but it's something like the Ice Storm meets Boogie Nights. Right. Uh, stylistically, voiceover, again, sort of evoking an era. Mm. And I would definitely call it a drama with touches of comedy. And, you know, that, those are the films that I like the best. I'm a big fan of the... Um, you know, uh, New Hollywood in the 70s, and you know, whether it's uh, Altman or Scorsese or Coppola, uh, those are the films when the studios kind of gave these guys free reign that seemed to have the most resonance and, and lasting impact and timelessness. Uh, it would be a pleasure to get to make a film like that. We'll yeah, see if absolutely. They let me do it. That'd be great. And, um, you know, I feel like every production has its one day that feels like insurmountable odds are against this movie ever happening. Was there one day which you had to? You had all the challenges sort of hit that you had to sort of step up as a director and... Uh... Every day. <laughs> How many days did you guys shoot this in? 20 days. It's not very long. Which, which is why I say that, because when you only have 20 days, every second counts. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, it's always an uphill battle. Uh, we were truly blessed to have not only a great and original writer, but a tremendous executive producer, Greg, who when I needed more money for stuff, he would somehow find it from someone or there was one day where it was I could either have the steps on the stage that were meant to be the Roman Senate or a steady cam. And I said, Greg, <laughs> I gotta have both. And we each cut checks. We just yeah. paid for it out of our pocket because we both knew that it just needed to be done uh, to make the movie better. So um, you know, That's when great. you have a, a, a really uh, a low budget, and a, and a tight schedule, every second counts. And again, that's why it becomes a team effort and everyone's, there's no time for divas, team mm. behavior or, uh, or wasted time. And uh, luckily I had a great team around me to help me pull that's it great. off. And you had a great cast too. The best cast in, in, that I could ever think of. We got everybody that we wanted for the right roles when for some reason scheduling or another, um, we couldn't have who we wanted or who we thought we wanted, it would somehow miraculous, miraculously become the perfect actor for the mm. role. And, you know, again, as I say, um, uh, it's a, casting is the major aspect of what you do. And with the right actor and the right role, you know, directing is much more of a guidance thing with, mm. with actors. You know, you're just kind of letting them do their thing and maybe they'll look to you to be the audience and proxy, uh, but it just kind of, you know, sustains itself when you have great actors who make interesting choices, which for the most part, I would say, to a man and woman I had on this movie. That's great. And Michael, you know, you just wrapped that play, this movie's coming out. I mean, what's next for you? What are your focuses right now? Um, well, I, I have, a, there's an ABC miniseries about Bernie Madoff that I finished filming. And with Richard Dreyfuss is playing uh, Bernie Madoff, and he's tremendous. And that'll be on in February on ABC. And I did this little film with um, Jameson Locasio is his name. He's 21 years old. Wow. He wrote a is script. Is that the filmmaker that uh, Yeah, that's who Chris this. was yeah. referring to. He wrote a script and he said, you know, I'd like to meet you and, and you know, if you read the script. And I said, okay. And I met him. <laughs> he had everything planned out. He had his storyboards and everything. And I said, hey, you know what? Uh, I like your script and everything. If, if, he says, if I get the money, will you do it? I said, yeah, you let me know. And he called me up like three months later. He said, I got the money, Mr. Rispoli. And I said, great, <laughs> let's do the film. And we shot it really gonzo out of like the trunk of their cars and stuff like that. And oh, it was wow. great because, you know, I love that. Because, again, I come from off, off, off Broadway. And right. it just felt great. So that's called The Depths, and they're putting it together now. And now there's something else called... Um, 
Sounds like a mob movie, and it's kind of really not. Uh, <laughs> Mickey Sleeps with the Fishes. But, but it's about Mickey Mantle. Oh, wow. Um, so it's a, different, it's a different thing. It's, you know, kids who are 12 years old. So, so anyways, yeah, there's always, uh, yeah, I'm busy. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can't wait for all of that. Well, now we're going to throw to you guys, actually, for questions. I'm sure you have a few. So just put your hand up and... Uh... Hi, um, you were talking about um, getting to know the same kind of NYC mob extras yeah. and getting to know them over time. I'm just wondering if you were able to bring those guys into the movie, either playing those mob extras or playing, you know, guys who helped out in the film and got those people on board. That's listen. That's a great question. Um, but here's the thing: the movie again, it's a lower budget film, so <laughs> there's not a lot of extras in the film. There are people who are very familiar, which was a conscious choice by Chris. Uh, like, do you see Louis uh, Venaria there? Louis's got the nose. He's, he's a tremendous guy. He was in the Bronx there. He's great. He's, he's been in a bunch yeah. of things. And Joe D'Onofrio plays Big Vinny. He was in the Bronx Tale. He was in, um, he was the young Joe Pesci in Goodfellas. So all of these guys are, you know, have played all these little character roles. So now they get to play the extras in it, but we really don't have any extras in the film. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it is a good question. Uh, we tried to do kind of a meta thing with the casting of the actual actors. What does meta mean? Chris? We had this conversation, <laughs> Michael. I'm going to def I'm going to define get it. Here you go. It's sort of meta. outside itself, story within a story kind of thing. I wanted the audience to think that these actors playing guys who look familiar look familiar. And of course, you go for the best performer and the um, you know the best actor, uh, or the best one you can get. Uh, but we really were conscious of of Joe D'Onofrio being young Joe Pesci in Goodfellas and how an audience member would react to that. Because normally you don't want in a movie to do anything to take the audience out of it, even for a moment, whether it's a mistake, continuity error, or or just something that takes them out of like the dream that's the movie. But this is that movie. Where, you know, I ha uh, you know, you, it's okay. I think to be remembering that it's a movie. In fact, it helps. Um, so uh, we consciously did that, and then the rest of the actors are all mine and Greg Greenberg's family, <laughs> uh, and you know, my girlfriend and so my, you know, a lot of people uh, just helped out. I mean, we had a minor budget for a handful of extras, and there were. Um, days where we just had them all changing position and moving to another part of the theater, shooting it in front of green screens. So there is, when you see a full house, it's actually about 40 people, all the same people just mix and match throughout the room, uh, which is you know the magic of CGI in this day and age. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, atmosphere is so important in a film. So I did go out of my way. There's a few faces in there that really look like the kind of uh, you know, they look like someone that would be from that area. You just try to do it, and it helps. It helps have a good extras casting person who you tell them what you want, and they send you a bunch of pictures, and you pick the people, and they come do it. It's great. Hey guys, how you doing? Hey man, um, this movie looks amazing. Uh, speaking about atmosphere, um, I'm just curious to know, um, during your careers, is there anything that you guys have learned over the course of time that helped you elevate? You know what you do as a filmmaker or an actor from anybody on set um, any actors or anybody from the crew um, did they did you guys receive some sort of advice to help like wow like that was I'm glad somebody told me that because that helped me uh, you know way. what that, that's great man that's a great again another great question um, yes I've I have learned that you treat everybody with respect and everybody with value um, I, when I started doing film I, I, and TV, I kind of popped right on the scene. I became the lead of a show. And so in my mind, I was still that off-off Broadway actor. And we had to paint our own sets and make our own costumes and everything. So I was always um, very aware of the working man because I w always felt like a working man. So. Uh, being on the set with everybody, and they also, what do you need, number one? They call you number one because <laughs> you're number one on the call sheet. You know, that's just, what do you need, number one? Stop calling me that, you know. But um, they really, they, they treat you with deference, and I'll be like, hey, relax, it's okay. I can get my own chair. I can do this stuff. You talk to them about what their interests are. You learn from them because I was learning as I was coming up my own self, you know. And um, so, you know, um, 
there are some people who really take that, you know, what do you want, number one? I want this and this and this and this and stand over there. And you don't learn anything from that. And you certainly don't, I guess, gather respect, maybe, you know, from, uh, from the people around you. Because there's the old saying, the people you meet on your way up, you're going to meet them on the way down. You know, so uh, you're going to run into them again on the way down. So uh, just treat everybody with respect and pick up, you know, learn from whatever it is. If you're sitting there in an, in an extra's chair, an extra's holding, the scene's going on, see how they do it. See what they're doing. So when you get called, you're ready to go. And then some of you say, hey, you know what, this guy knows what he's doing. Let's put him over here. And then from there, they might say, you know what, can you say this line? Boom, you just got elevated, you know. So it's a generosity of spirit. I, I use that term quite often because that's where... I feel blessed in my life that I was offered a great, given a great generosity of spirit from people. They were very nice to me. And the people who weren't nice to me, I just, I didn't think one way or the other. I just didn't waste energy with that, you know. But, uh, but there was only a few of those people anyway. So, you know, so yeah, just uh, kind of be nice to elevate everybody. And then you yourself will elevate, you know, all the tide. What is that? What's that term? A high, a tide, all boats, what is that? Tide, uh, rising tide raises all boats. There yeah, you go. Yeah, there go. That's exactly it. Uh, to address that, I would also quickly say, and, and Michael spoke to it a little bit, that um, when you can, surround yourself with as many people who know more than you or are experienced than you as you can, rather than be in any way make it about you or threatened by that, because you'll raise your game just so you don't embarrass yourself. But, you know, beyond that, particularly in filmmaking or any collaborative medium or any collaborative undertaking, you're only as good as the people around you. If you're somehow somewhere near the center of it, it doesn't really matter how much you know or how hard you work if the people who are working with you on it um, aren't up to the task. And uh, again, I was very, very lucky and I agonized uh, you know, long hours over making sure that everybody that I worked with was somebody that I would get along with, that I could get along with, that I had respect for, they had respect for me, and for the most part, who had made you know more movies than I had, um, and you know it, it it turned out to be the best filmmaking experience of my career because of that, largely. After you complete your film, what's the feeling like the day before it's premiered? Like, are you up all night? Are you worried that people are going to like it? Uh, yeah, I, you know, the, uh, anticipation, excitement, uh, dread uh, certainly comes into it a little bit. You know, you, you want people to like it. You want, um, you know, but the payoff can be really nice. There's few things as enjoyable as watching a group of people, even one person, but a room full of people enjoying something that you put out there in a way that, you know, makes their life better for even just a second. Um, I, I get a huge kick out of that. So, uh, and you know, it's um, my, movies to me are a way for people to sort of get out of the daily grind and sort of be transported into somewhere else or just be entertained. Um, so, in that regard, they are important. There are many more important things that people do out in the world. Uh, and, you know, I have great respect and admiration for those kind of things, but you know, what actors do and what storytellers do, there's a reason that stories are so prevalent in, in every culture and they're essentially all the same stories. It's because we're all the same. I'm, uh, I'm curious about the, the script and the writing process. Uh, you've got like play within a play, you've got mistaken identity, you've got an all's well that ends well sort of story that goes on. Are these conscious reflections of these Shakespearean conventions, and what was the general writing process for a script like this like? <laughs> this one is pretty circuitous, but and labyrinthine, I would say. But uh, Greg Greenberg, as we mentioned earlier, initiated the idea. He uh, was writing a play um, called Tessio and Clemenza Are Dead, The Godfather from the point of view of Tessio and Clemenza, just like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, is you know Hamlet from the point of view of two minor characters. Uh, and he, he had this like germ of an idea that he uh, wrote a, a very, very solid and entertaining script about that he sent out to a bunch of festivals and got some even awards. And, but he, when he finally got it to Michael Mailer, who's a producer of, of experience and note in New York, um, Michael sent it to me. Um, I liked it. There were things I wanted to change, but I was immediately, by the 10 pages in, I was laughing and really wanted to do it. Um, you know, I was... Um, uh, reticent to convey some of the things that maybe I wanted to work on and change. I just wanted the job. 
But um, once once we I got to know Greg a bit, and then in particular when you know we did a bunch of rewrites for a few weeks, and then once we brought Michael on board, um, we started as Michael touched upon earlier, like working late into the night in Greg's kitchen. Um, where his wife and children had to sort of deal with the fact that we were occasionally getting a, a tad heated or, you know, I was sneaking outside for cigarettes every 20 minutes. Um, but um, the process was, you know, uh, very organic. So once we got into the groove, and that's really how it has to be, and it sort of addresses the other thing you asked, which is that some of the conceits are Shakespearean, and it's about Shakespeare, that, that comes about when you're, you know, when you're, when you're working with uh, people who are all on the same page and you have such a great idea uh, and experience and, and a little bit of talent and, some, and, and, and you just keep pushing, these things present themselves to you, these sort of organic epiphanies, mini epiphanies that you say, oh, wow, I didn't even see that and there it is. Um, and, it, and it was there all the time, but it just needed to be explored and found. Uh, so the process was a lot of give and take. Uh, and then, of course, you know, right leading up until we got too busy actually preparing to make the movie to keep working on the script and where we felt pretty comfortable with it. And you got to have that going in. And then you have to go in with the attitude that you're um, definitely going to have to change things on the day and that it's going to then get rewritten again in the edit. Um, you know, Woody Allen always likes to say that he writes it on the page in his bedroom and he's laughing his ass off. And then he gets on the set and the grips don't laugh and he's devastated. And then he gets into the editing room and his editor is laughing and he rejoices. And then he goes to the theater and it dies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it, this is the best joke writer and writer of female roles in the history of cinema. And he doesn't know. So it would be presumptuous of us to think that we know, but we do try to. Um, you know, aim to please ourselves and also to, uh, I think, a large degree, um, I find that when the actors feel good about what they're doing, they're probably right. Just like when an actor is telling you, this isn't working for me, I can't find a truthful place to get to what it is you're asking me to do, there's probably something wrong. Um, and, or when you're trying to create something on a film set and then reality starts impinging and it's getting in your way, there's probably a reason for that too and maybe just embrace it. And it's the same with writing. It has to be organic and you know, you push and you push, but you can't force it. I would like to say that the script that Greg had written had all these ideas in it and all, and this was Greg doing it by himself in his room for a long time. He, you know, he just worked diligently, he writes and writes and writes. So once we got to air it out and therefore expand, on these elements when we were sitting around the table and saying, now wait a minute, let's make this stronger, let's make this clearer, let's infuse these other Shakespearean elements because they're there, we need to expand them to, to bring them about. So as far as the writing process, that's what it was. It was a kind of an opening, a stretching, a, the same not necessarily need this, but this is great, let's keep going that way and then you find how great it is because you take it, you know, you improvise while you're writing and say this and this and this and this. All of that creativity was able to blossom when we all got into the room. But it was all based off of that seed, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea that Greg had again, Brando, Mafia films, Guys and Dolls, and Shakespeare, it's just, it's, it's, that's a once-in-a-lifetime idea, in my opinion. Uh, hopefully not once in a lifetime. Uh, I'm sorry, that's five it. times in that's a lifetime. That's it, Greg, you're done. That's it, that was the one time. Take it easy, Greg. <laughs> well, I would like to thank all of you for coming here and seeing um, you know, the clips that have been shown. And Charles, thank you. And, um, and uh, you know, for us to be here, because this is, I mean, this is great. This is a treat. And, great you know, conversation. Having a, yeah. yeah, having a great conversation. I mean, thank you very much for, for coming. And please, uh, find the film and see the film. Start You're showing really it uh, November 6th, guys. Spread the word. Tell your friends, social media. And Chris, if you have anything to add where people can find information on... Uh, uh, well, yeah, it's uh, opening. Uh, you can go to the Facebook page, French and Romans Facebook page. Uh, it's opening in, um, like, seven or eight cities this weekend and all the other, you know, cable media venues, you know, going forward. And, uh, you know, you'll be able to find it if you want to see it. And it's a lot of fun. It's great. Small Thank films you. need support, man. So go, go spread the word for Thank sure. You. One more hand for Chris Cublin and Michael Raspoli. Thanks so much, guys.